Hi, everyone, and welcome to the uh, live event that we're hosting with the Brown Planetarium's Your Universe series. I'm Dana Thompson, the director of the Brown Planetarium, and I'm really excited to be bringing this presentation to you all. And we're hosting Michael McConville with us today, who is one of my favorite people in the planetarium field. And uh, he's going to be leading us on an exploration of Earth's craters. So we're really happy to have Michael here. But before I turn it over to Michael, I want to give you some background about what we've been doing this week for your universe series, and then also some things you need to know um, for the presentation today. So this week is all about planet Earth. For our Your Universe virtual series, we're taking a week to explore a different object in our universe. And we're going, we started with the sun, we explored Mercury, we explored Venus, and now we're exploring Earth. And we can't really explore Earth without also exploring our closest natural object to us in space, and that is our moon. Well, you can see here a lot of differences between our Earth and our moon. Our Earth is much larger than it, about four times bigger than our moon at 8,000 miles across. And there are some differences in the surfaces of these two objects, right? Our planet Earth is about 71% liquid water and the moon does not have any liquid water on its surface as you can see here. We also have an atmosphere that surrounds our planet and it has our air that we breathe it also has weather. You can see that in the clouds here, but it protects us from various things that come in from space and some other rocks in space too. And so we have different objects in space besides the earth and our moon. We have things like comets, asteroids, meteoroids, meteors, and meteorites. And now what's the difference between all of these? And do we really need to categorize things like this? And the answer is yes, we're scientists. So we have to have categories for things. And all of these things are a little bit different. So we put them into their own little um, areas here. So we have a comet, we have chunks of ice and rock that originate from our outer solar system really far away from the sun where it's cold. And when they enter or come closer to the sun and warm up those ices sometimes melt or go from a solid directly to a gas and they create these tails. Well, we also have closer things to the sun like asteroids and asteroids are more rocky. There's not really a lot of ices there. And asteroids mostly orbit between Mars and Jupiter, but sometimes they get a little close to Earth. Well, there's smaller rocks in space too. There's meteoroids and meteoroids are larger than a dust grain, but smaller than an asteroid. And if that meteoroid or a space rock comes into our atmosphere, enters into the air that surrounds our planet, it compresses the air so fast because it's going a 100,000 miles an hour usually, and it compresses that air and it creates a lot of heat. And that process, um, that compression of air is what we refer to sometimes as ram pressure. And it's that heat that makes that space rock glow. And we call those meteors, or you see them sometimes as shooting stars in your sky. Um, and if that meteor survives that heat, and that turbulence coming into our atmosphere, uh, and it actually collides with our planet, we call it a meteorite. So if a meteor makes it all the way to the ground here on Earth, we call it a meteorite. And we know that sometimes when a meteorite collides with our planet, it can form a crater. Now we see a lot of craters on the moon because again, it doesn't have an atmosphere to slow down those space rocks. And so it just gets hit a lot and there's a lot of damage on the moon from all that incoming rock. Also, the moon doesn't have any liquid water. It's all rock. So if something were to land on in water, it would just create a large splash on the moon. You don't have that. So you just see a lot of craters there. There are other things that I think we're going to be talking about later on of why you see more craters maybe on the moon and not so much on Earth. But just want to give you an overview of what a crater is, kind of the anatomy of a crater. And as you can see here in this, this bottom image, when that rock, when that meteorite hits our planet, it creates this crater, a pit, a hole basically in the ground. 
And there's a lot of heat that happens when this collision happens on earth and it throws material out. It's called ejecta layers. And um, all of this sometimes bounces back up the center peak anyway, can happen when there's like a bounce back. So uh, the surface rebounds after the impact and it creates a central peak on the floor of some of the largest craters. So basically a meteorite can come and hit our planet, create a hole, and we can observe them on our moon, but also on our planet Earth. And we would be I'm thrilled to be able to bring you this presentation in our planetarium at Ball State University. It's a 16 meter dome. It's the largest in Indiana, but unfortunately we can't do that, but we have the next best thing. We have our guest speaker, Michael McConville with us today, who's going to lead us on a journey using Google Earth. And I'm gonna turn it over to him so that we can see what that's all about. Well, thank you, Dana, and thank you to the team at Ball State for uh, hosting me this afternoon. Uh, and like Dana said, we're going to have a, a, a little bit more of a, a laid back tour of our planet today. Of course, our Earth is special in the solar system. It's the only place we know of that has uh, liquid water on the surface. It's, of course, the only place that has life. And like the other planets in our solar system, our planet's been hit many, many times in our history by rocks from space. We've had meteorites and asteroids and comets that have impacted the surface. The big difference between our planet and the rest of the solar system is that we have erosive uh, uh, tendencies. We have water and rain, there's plate tectonics, there's dust, there's humans. And all of these combine to erode away craters. And so while we may have a few of them still visible on the planet of the Earth, uh, on the surface of the Earth, we don't have them in the same numbers that we might find on Mercury or Mars, places that don't have uh, substantial atmospheres to protect them. So what we'll do this afternoon is take a little tour through history, starting with craters that are very recent geologically, this might be a few thousand years old, to craters that are millions or even billions of years old uh, that have been um, preserved on the surface of our planet. But of course, I think the best place for us to start to give us a little bit of context about where we are and where we're going on our planet is to travel to Muncie. So we're going we're gonna to visit uh, the Brown Planetarium. And as Dana said, the Brown Planetarium is about 16 meters in diameter, uh, roughly 52, 53 feet across. And that's a fairly large planetarium. It gives us a good basis to compare the size of the planetarium to the size of some of the impact craters that we're going to see. We don't have very small craters, maybe ones that are a few feet across. Those would immediately get get filled up with water or uh, wind or rain might erode them away. We have very large craters, but those are incredibly rare. To have something that could make a crater hundreds of miles in diameter is something that might only hit the earth two or three times in our history. So a lot of the craters we're going to be looking at this afternoon are going to be on the smaller side, a few miles in diameter at their largest, in some cases, maybe just a few hundred feet. And we'll begin our journey uh, by heading over to Europe. We're gonna visit the um, Baltic country of Estonia and an island called Surima. Surima is home to one of the youngest known craters on the planet. It's called Kali Crater. And as we zoom on in, you'll notice it's going to take a while for us to get close enough to the earth to see the crater. Geologists and astronomers think that this crater was uh, created about 4,000 years ago, uh, recently enough that we know that this area was populated. We also believe that the, uh, the visibility of the crater, that people saw the meteorite hit the surface, and it played a large role in sort of the local mythology, um, especially uh, the further north you go, the fire came from the sky or came from the gods. This crater you'll see here in the center uh, is now currently uh, an area that's, it's a lake uh, surrounded by forest. The crater itself, 
a little more than 300 feet across. So roughly the size of an American football field. And whatever created this, we think, hit the earth at a speed of 30 or 40,000 miles per hour. It was moving very, very fast, weighed something along the lines of 80 tons, and would have had the same explosive impact as one of the nuclear weapons that was dropped on Japan in World War II. This would have been a serious issue for the people living in the area. And this is going to be one of the smallest craters we talk about this afternoon. We'll go back in time a little more, a few thousand years further than that, uh, and find ourselves in central Australia. One of the best places to look for meteorites, for the, the fragments of these objects on the Earth's surface, are deserts. Because they rarely change, uh, and because you have very large expanses of sand, it's usually very easy to see the dark iron of the meteorites sticking out from the sand dunes. In the central part of the country are what are known as the Henbury meteorites. These date back about 6,000 years, uh, and there are several craters in an area that the, uh, the country have now designated a national monument. So what we're able to do is to uh, show you the extent of the two central craters. Uh, the main one at the top is about 600 feet in diameter. So now we're talking two football fields in width, while the lower crater has been shaped a little bit by erosion and rain over the thousands of years since the impact. But if we zoom back just a little bit more, we're also able to see a ring of meteorites, uh, of meteor impacts that cause a series of smaller craters. One of the reasons we don't see more craters in this region is very apparent when we zoom back even further. This is an area that four or 5,000 years ago had flowing water. This would have been an old riverbed and all of that water would have eroded away all but the largest craters that we still see today. And to uh, sort of complete our tour of, of desert craters, uh, we're going to go to northern Africa, to the country of Mauritania. In the Sahara Desert is a crater known as the Tunormer Crater. It's a little bit over a mile in diameter and more than 300 feet deep. Uh, so this is a pretty substantial crater out in the middle of the, the desert. And as we zoom on in, you'll notice a crater that looks very similar to the ones we might be familiar with uh, in other parts of the solar system. Other than wind and sand, there's not much rain here in the Sahara Desert to erode away the rim of the crater, the edge of the crater that you see there. But what has happened is that most of the inside of the crater has filled up. We believe there's about a thousand feet of sand that has collected inside of this crater in the past 25,000 years uh, since it, it uh, was created uh, back then. The object to create a mile wide asteroid might be only about a hundred feet across. So imagine three, four school buses laid end to end that size object hit in the earth at tens of thousands of miles per hour is more than enough to leave a mile wide crater in the middle of the desert. But these are all very, very distant from Indiana, maybe difficult for you to get to Mauritania or central Australia. Maybe you want something a little bit closer to home to see what a crater might be like on Earth. Uh, and here in the United States, we have one of the best preserved craters of all. It's known as Meteor Crater, and it's found outside the town of Winslow, Arizona. This is the perfect crater on the Earth's surface. If you think about what a crater should look like, Meteor Crater is about as, as perfect an example as you're going to find. Michael, we have a question if you have, um, if you don't mind. Absolutely. Uh, Christine is asking, how do people know when it's a hole made from an object coming from space or if it's maybe Earth made from different geological processes? Uh, and do we have a written history for these? That is an excellent question. For the very recent uh, craters within the last few thousand years where we've had the written word, um, we generally see 
a, a combination of something fell from the sky and then there's a big hole. So there's a cause and effect. Most of the, the time, what we find inside of these supposed craters are very high concentrations of iron and nickel. And most of the asteroids in our solar system, uh, most of, say, the parent objects for the meteors that might hit the Earth, have very high concentrations of iron and nickel. So if we find, in some cases, in Meteor Crater's case, um, we have found nearly eight tons, so 16,000 pounds of iron nickel rocks uh, that we are certain are meteorites. They're of extraterrestrial origin. When we find those sorts of rocks, when we find those fingerprints of a meteorite, we can confirm that these are, are uh, extraterrestrial, that these are coming from space. There are some craters uh, that are not extraterrestrial in origin. Um, the most famous of those would be Crater Lake in the state of Oregon. Um, it is not a crater from space, but a volcano that erupted and then had its slopes collapse inward to produce a crater that looks almost identical to some of the things that we're going to see. But geologists are looking for iron and nickel. And if we see a lot of iron and nickel in these craters, then we can confirm 99% of the time that whatever made it came from space and not something of earthly origin. So a, a fantastic question. And Meteor Crater was one of the first places in the world where we were able to find very real evidence of, of, of a meteorite impact. Um, there are still, it's believed, to be about 100 tons of iron nickel meteorite still inside the crater, just hasn't been um, excavated yet. But while looking at this from up top is really, really nice, an even better view of Meteor Crater uh, occurs when we get down to the rim. Um, this is one of the few craters on Earth where you can easily get to the edge of it. In some cases, you can get inside of it. Uh, if you were an Apollo astronaut in the 1960s and 70s, you were able to train for lunar landings inside of Meteor Crater. So 50,000 years ago, you're out in the Arizona desert. It's a little bit different. Um, the climate and, and the environment are, are not uh, what they are today. It's a cool, temperate forest. Um, so a lot of big animals, a lot of, uh, of heavily forested areas. And this object, which we believe was about one, um, about 150, 160 feet in, in diameter, hit the earth traveling 30,000 miles per hour and left the crater that we see here, one that's nearly a mile across. Anything within four miles would have been incinerated. And that goes for animal and plant life alike. Uh, this is a major, major impact. Uh, if we were to compare this to a nuclear explosion, it's the equivalent of 10 million tons of TNT. Um, some of the largest weapons that the uh, United States or the Soviet Union ever created um, couldn't even reach that level. So this would have been a major impact, would have had devastating effects to anything or anyone living in the region of the impact. It's not taking out a country, but it certainly would have been able to take out a city very, very quickly. So we're glad 50,000 years ago, uh, not a lot of people living out here in, in Arizona, uh, just you know, mostly um, plants and, and animals, but someplace we wouldn't necessarily wanna be during that impact. And of course, we can jump around the world. We've got a few more we want to visit. Uh, one of those is in India. This is Lonar Crater. Uh, Lonar Crater is a little bit older. Now we're getting back about 60,000 years. Uh, and this is a crater that shows us one of the big problems with finding craters on Earth is that if you have a big hole in the ground, uh, it's likely to fill up with water pretty quickly. And so Lonar Crater is better known in India as Lake Lonar. Uh, and as we zoom in here towards the surface, uh, you're going to see exactly why. It is a, a fairly large lake. Uh, the lake itself is about a mile and a half uh, in diameter. We can also see that the edge of the crater is considerably bigger. And so from that red circle inward is about a 500 foot drop 
down towards the surface of the lake. Because of its location, and it's not actually two colors, it's just two images from uh, the Google Maps uh, uh, collection, uh, this lake is known in particular for its distinct types of salt. And so there are five different types of salt that are mined from the shores of this lake, largely because of its, of its uh, extraterrestrial origin. So because it's cut off from the rest of the region, there's no water that gets in uh, or out from streams. It's all due to water uh, from rain and evaporation. We see these minerals that have developed over the course of now almost 60,000 years. Uh, it's a popular tourist attraction in this part of India as well. And if we were to take a look from inside the crater, uh, say down near the, the level of the lake, we'd see the lake itself and then that crater wall coming up much higher. So down at lake level, you can't see outside of the crater's rim. But now we can get older. Let's get a little bit bigger. Let's get a little bit more um, out there in location. Let's travel uh, all the way up to Siberia uh, and visit a, a lake up there known as El Gedegedetskin. It is very isolated. This is a part of Russia. It's about as far removed as any place that you can imagine. But because of its isolation, uh, this crater is incredibly important for us understanding the history of climate change on our planet. The crater itself and the lake that now fills it are about 4 million years old, but they were never covered by glaciers during any of Earth's ice ages. That means that all of the material that has settled at the bottom of the lake is uninterrupted. So when geologists go and drill cores into the lake floor, they're able to see an uninterrupted history of the Earth's climate from this region. That's really important with us trying to figure out how climate is moving in the future. One of the ways that we learn is by reading the past. And this crater in particular, about eight miles on both sides, is one of the great places on our planet to find that sort of information. But maybe we want the purest water on earth. Maybe we want a, a, a perfectly circular crater. We want something that looks exactly the way we look in a textbook. And for that, we're gonna to travel to Canada, which got a few more uh, craters to move through history. Uh, this is known as Pingualit Crater. It's in the very Northern reaches of the province of Quebec and is more than 2 million years old. Uh, this is a perfectly circular crater with a very high rim, which means that with rain and snow, all the water you might need for this crater is going to be generated. This is some of the cleanest and clearest water on earth. Um, boats have been able to see down more than a hundred feet under the surface of the water. That's how clear it is. And is one of the purest freshwater lakes in the entire world. Uh, to give you an idea, Lake Superior has a salinity, how much salt is in it, of 500 parts per million. It is the least salty of the Great Lakes. The Pingualit Crater Lake is five parts per million, which means that you cannot find much fresher water on the surface of the earth as you might find here in Northern Canada. But as impressive as this is, it is nowhere near the most impressive crater in Canada. It's gonna be a little bit further to the south in Quebec. It's known as Metacongwin Reserve. And it is so large that it is easily visible from space. Uh, space shuttle astronauts took a number of pictures of this crater uh, while in orbit in the 80s and in the 90s. Uh, it is one of the largest craters that we've seen on Earth, almost 60 miles across. Uh, and has been around for so long, over 200 million years, that it has not only filled in as it would be as a lake, but we've also seen the rebound of the land inside the lake from the ice ages to produce the island that you see in the center. So this lake, the Manicongwin Reservoir, 45 miles across, 
The rim of the crater goes out an extra 10 miles on each side. And then of course you can see the island there in the center. This is a huge crater that if you weren't looking for all of the telltale signs of, of an extraterrestrial crater, the iron nickel meteorites or the rebounding of the crater rim, you would just think this is a big lake with a, uh, um, uh, a uh, an island in the middle. One of the things you get with islands inside of lakes is that there are lakes on the island in the lake. Uh, and then there is an island in the lake, on the island in the lake in Quebec. So it just, it's lakes and, and, and craters all the way down. And uh, at 215 million years old is one of the very oldest craters we have on the planet. But we're gonna go really old. Let's go back as far as we can to the oldest known crater on earth. It's known as Vredfort Dome. It's located in South Africa. And it's believed to be more than 1 billion years old. We know that from the, uh, the rocks that are inside of the crater. Originally, this crater, 300 miles across. Whatever hit the Earth was 10, maybe 12 miles across. This would have devastated the entire planet. Something that big hits us today and civilization ceases to exist. But what we have now is what's known as the dome, the center part of this crater. It's all that's left. And it's just outside of the city of Redifort in South Africa. So as we zoom in, you can see that we do have sort of these, these semi-circular um, mountain ridges here. Those are the outer and edge of the dome itself. And so this is what is left of the crater. These are about 40 miles in diameter. So much smaller than the main crater. It's what happens after a billion years of erosion. But what about craters that you can't see? Uh, probably the most famous crater on the earth is one that you cannot get to directly. It is the Shishalub crater uh, and it's located just off the edge of the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. It is most famous because the impact that created the Shishalu crater is also certainly the asteroid or comet that helped to kill off the dinosaurs. Uh, this occurred about 66 million years ago. We have a crater that is half in ocean and half on land, although we do not see a crater rim on the surface. What we've needed to do is look at um, the specific gravity of the materials that are in the ground. Essentially, what's the density of the materials underneath the surface so that we can determine, do we have a lot of iron, do we have a lot of nickel, or do we have minerals and rocks that are a little bit more earth-like? And what we find is that along the edge of this crater are a number of cenotes. Uh, the ancient Maya uh, believed these to be ceremonial openings to the, to the afterlife and to the underworld. Uh, we know them as sinkholes. And these sinkholes occur when the, the ceilings of caves collapse. And all of those cenotes, those white dots that you see here in the picture, match very, very closely to the edge of the crater. So we know that once this massive object hit the earth, we saw the crater uh, 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 emerge from the land part of the Yucatan. And over time, the caves that were created by the impact have begun to deteriorate. And so we see all of these sinkholes along the edge. In the center, where we see the yellows, the reds, and the pinks, are areas where the gravity is much higher. This means we've got a lot of iron and nickel, very dense materials. And that's an important aspect. The amount of iron and nickel wouldn't occur naturally on Earth, but would occur naturally with a large asteroid. And that means that as we look at the geology of Mexico, we can compare it to the geology of Italy or Montana or Australia. And at the exact same time, geologically on the Earth, we see iron and nickel laid down in a very, very thin layer. And inside of all of it is an element called iridium. It is a metal that is very rare on Earth, but is extremely prevalent in asteroids. 
And the only way this much iridium could get into one place on Earth in this short amount of time is if something like an asteroid hit the Earth and spread its material over the planet. So for uh, the dinosaurs, it was a terrible, terrible day when the, the Shishalub meteorite hit the Earth. Now, of course, that allowed uh, humans to emerge as one of the, the, the great mammal species down the line. But after 150 million years, the dinosaurs reign uh, came to an end. And of course, now we have just the avian dinosaurs, birds left over from this part of the Cretaceous period. And so in just a few minutes, we've been able to walk ourselves through a history of the earth from the recent to the very, very distant in our past and see that like other planets in our solar system, we get hit by meteorites all the time. But because of our atmosphere, because of the protection of planets like Jupiter, we do not get as many big impacts as we used to. But we can still see some of the scars on the surface of our world of those objects that we're able to get through. And so um, as you keep looking up throughout the year, as you hear things about meteor showers and you see those falling stars, those bright flashes of green light moving across the sky, um, many of those are the size of dust grains. And here we're looking at objects that could be hundreds, thousands, uh, even feet across, even miles across in some cases. Um, so Dana, I will turn it back to you guys. Uh, but thank you for uh, letting us walk through the history of the earth today. Thank you so much, Michael. That was really amazing. And that's not something that we usually get to do in the planetarium. We don't really focus on earth that much. Uh, oddly enough, uh, we focus on the other planets in our, in our universe. Um, so if there's any questions, go ahead and drop them in the chat and we'll try to get them answered before we wrap it up today. And there's just a little bit of a delay here. So uh, bear with us as we, um, we work through that delay. But if you do have any questions, put them in the chat and we'll get them answered. Absolutely. One of my favorite things about learning about impacts is, is just how our atmosphere protects it. But then also we have our weather and water erosion that erase craters over time. We have volcanic eruptions that can cover craters. And so the world is just constantly changing and, and erasing things that um, that were there. So the fact that we can even see any right now is is uh, really, really neat. And we know um, we know that there are a lot of impacts, uh, a lot of meteorite impacts with the Earth um, on a daily basis. We have satellites in orbit whose job originally it was to look for bright explosions. Uh, essentially trying to keep treaties in place and spying on other countries to see if they were testing weapons. We also figured out that every day there seemed to be flashes that didn't correspond to countries, um, bright flashes in the middle of the oceans. And scientists were very quick to realize that we were watching impacts of meteorites with the atmosphere. Uh, in some cases, big enough to be the size of like small bombs. And we'd see them all of the time. And we're able to track that to where during the times of the year where we might be passing through the tail of a comet, when we experience a meteor shower, we see an uptick in the number of those instances. Uh, and in some cases, we see very, very large impacts where a meteorite might be able to make its way completely through the atmosphere and land on the surface of the Earth. Um, those are rare, uh, as, as you might imagine, but even uh, a piece of iron and nickel that's a few feet across can have enough energy uh, and enough mass at the beginning to make its way through the Earth's surface and, and land um, somewhere. Um, if you want to become a, a meteorite hunter, for example, uh, you'd go to places like the Sahara or the Gobi Desert in Asia or Australia or Antarctica, where in many cases they're finding meteorites on the surface and not just from the asteroid belt. Uh, we've discovered on Earth asteroids from Venus, the Moon, and Mars, uh, which means it's almost certain that during one of the big uh, uh, impacts for us that Earth meteorites or Earth meteors uh, were sent to other places in, in the solar system. So it's possible that if we visit Mars, or we visit Venus, or we visit Mercury, if we're able to do something like that, we could conceivably find Earth rocks on another planet as well. So there's, there's a lot of this geology of the, the inner solar system, especially, that we see sort of this exchange between the planets. 
Yeah. So uh, Christine wants to know, is there threat of another impact that can do major damage? And uh, another thing I was going to mention is that our solar system has calmed down a lot over the what, four and a half billion years that it's been around. Uh, a long time ago, it was really messy. There's a lot of things flying around. There's a lot of collisions, but now it's it's pretty calm. Um, but we do have things coming near our planet. Um, there was an asteroid that just made a close approach to our planet, but it did mm -hmm. obviously did not hit. Uh, do you have any information on that? Yeah, you know, we're uh, NASA and, and asteroid hunters around the world have their eyes on, I think right now the number's a, a little bit over 8,000 asteroids that either cross the Earth's orbit or have the potential to in the future as they move their way around the solar system as the gravity of the planets interacts with them. Um, these near-Earth asteroids, um, what we would call potentially hazardous asteroids, if it's over a mile in size, we have a pretty good handle on it. Um, something a mile wide hitting the Earth is 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 a threat to civilization. Might not end life as we know it, but it's a threat to to pretty much everything that we do. It's the smaller, um, the ones that are a few hundred feet across, that are a little bit more difficult for us to find with regularity, that are the most dangerous. Um, back a few years ago, there was an uh, an asteroid or a part of an asteroid about a hundred feet across. Uh, that made its way into the Earth's atmosphere and it exploded, it disintegrated above the Russian town of Shablinsk. And this was a, a big explosion in the sky. Um, so much so that on the ground, it was something like 12,000 injuries. There were a few million dollars worth of, of damage in some places. Uh, people were sent to the hospital uh, because they, were, they would see this bright flash of light and they'd go to the window and because light travels considerably faster than sound, the shock wave of the explosion didn't reach them for a few minutes. And so as they're looking out the window and they see this bright streak of light, this shock wave would hit them and break windows. Uh, people were sent to the hospital with lacerations and gashes and things. Um, so loud in, in some cases uh, that it could cause um, uh, eardrums to rupture. And in some cases we saw uh, a flash of light bright enough that it could turn off street lights. It became as bright as day at 3, 30, 4 o'clock in the morning in Russia. We had no idea that it was, it was going to hit the earth until we got the reports out of Russia. It was coming from the direction of the sun. And so in the glare of the sun, we were not able to, to capture it. And those are the ones that, that are dangerous, um, the ones that we don't have any, um, any real preparation for, time really. for. Yeah. Uh, one of our favorite websites is spaceweather.com. And this actually, if you scroll through all the information that they have on the website, they have near earth asteroids, but they can, um, like Michael said, only track so many, but all the information about the distance they're going to miss our planet by, how fast they're going, their diameter is all kept here. And we can, we can track pretty small um, down, it looks like to six meters here. So spaceweather.com, if you want to uh, keep an eye on all of that weather going on in space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, probably the, the scariest close encounter we've had uh, was back in the very late 1980s. I want to say it was 1989. And we had an asteroid that hit the Earth's atmosphere. Um, it was probably about two or 300 feet across. But because of how shallow it came in, it actually skipped off the top of the Earth's atmosphere and flew off into space. It didn't make its way into the atmosphere completely. And so this, this little tiny blanket of air that, that separates us from the big bad universe, um, because of how the, the meteor came in, it compressed the air enough so that it would bounce back off uh, and would have been something where if it hit a city would have been catastrophic. Uh, that was one of the closest approaches we've had in the last hundred years um, within you know, roughly 20,000 miles of the surface of the earth. Great. Well, it looks like there's, there's no more questions. Uh, so thank you again, Michael. That was My really pleasure. amazing. Uh, and check us out on Friday because we have another live event 
from the Brown Planetarium for our Your Universe series. It's A Twinkling for Sea Turtles, A Tale of Moonlight, Streetlights, and Sea Turtles by Dr. Tom McConnell from the Department of Biology here at Ball State University. And thanks so much for joining us, everyone. If you do have any more questions or if you're watching this later on, just put them in the chat. We'll still try to answer them. But have a great day, everyone. Take care.